This is CSAP Science and Policy Podcast, where we're bringing you the latest evidence and expertise to improve public policymaking. This week, we're proud to present the seventh episode in our series on science, policy, and pandemics, which is brought to you in partnership with Cambridge Infectious Diseases and the Cambridge Immunology Network. In this episode, our host, Dr. Rob Doubleday, is joined by Dr. Meredith Crowley and Dr. Christopher Rao. So welcome. My name is Rob Doubleday from the Centre for Science and Policy, and today it's a great pleasure to welcome two colleagues from the Faculty of Economics. So we have with us Meredith Crowley, who's um, an international economist, works on trade policy, trade agreements, and behaviours of firms with respect to trade policy, and uh, Christopher Rao, who's uh, a labour economist and uh, was researches political economy. So it's, it's lovely to have Meredith and Christopher join us. I just want to start with a very sort of big high level question, and that is from the field of economics, what can we say about the nature, the, sc- the scale of the economic shock that we're currently living through? What do we know about it? So I think... Um Two things. I'll I'll compare the current crisis with 2008, 2009, because that's one that's familiar to many people. Um, the first thing is that when we compare the current crisis to previous ones, this is a bit unusual in an economic sense in that it began with a supply shock, um, with firms shutting down in different parts of the world, first China, then spreading throughout Western Europe, then spreading throughout North America. So on the first, we had an actual disruption in production that was far more synchronized and more global in scope than we had in any previous recession. And then this supply shock has spilled over into a demand shock as the workers and owners of these companies that are shut down now have much more limited income. They anticipate lower income growth in the future or negative income growth if they end up losing their business or if Um, government support for for salaries goes away. So more severe, um, and in a sense, the problem is more complex in that we have both a loss of income for workers. Once we get start putting workers back to work as the supply shock um, ameliorates as we start to lift lockdown, we're still going to have to deal with different aspects of consumer behavior. So I think people are very afraid They're not going to be eager to go out and start buying things. And so, you know, in sum, how does this compare in magnitude? Um, 30 million Americans filing for unemployment. This is unprecedented. We have nothing like this um, compared to 2008 and 2009. It's more globally synchronized. In 2008, 2009, China and India still had positive um, kind of their growth rates were somewhat weaker than they had been in the previous few years, but they were still large and positive. And so globally, this is much more severe. And I think we're in for a long and slow climb out of what's happening now. This is going to take a long time to um, get back to a sort of normal level of growth. Chris, from your point of view, particularly thinking about labour markets, what what do we know about the current economic shock? So I can only uh, second Meredith there that it's it's much more extreme than what we've seen before. To give you some idea, we find in our data that 15% of the people in of workers in the UK had lost their job due to the coronavirus. To put that into perspective, usually about 2 to 3% of people lose or quit their job from one month to the next. And also, usually in a recession, the increases in the unemployment rate, they're not actually coming from layoffs. They're coming from people being less likely to find jobs. Okay, so I imagine now that almost nobody's finding jobs. We might have some hiring in supermarkets and deliveries. And this is combined with huge layoffs. Now, I told you in the UK, it's 15%. Uh, In the US, we find something similar, 18%. So also very high number, but it seems that not all countries uh, are hit in the same way. So for Germany, we find that this number is only 5%. So the shock is huge. That's also a very large number, but we still see that uh, there are differences across countries. Thanks. And could you talk a little bit about the data? Because you're referring to research that you've carried out. Um, Are you seeing, I mean, maybe you could say a little bit about the research you've done and also what other data you're seeing? There's been a big problem with data, I, I find. So we see a lag in official data sources becoming available or even the data being collected. So that's why we went and collected our own data. 
per survey wave, we uh, collected data from 4,000 individuals, uh, geographically representative, and also in terms of individual characteristics, uh, fairly representative. But the I think the, the big problem is, is that we do not have all the data we should have. There are some comparable numbers out there, but they're usually just aggregates. So there are people that have collected some data in order to estimate the aggregate unemployment rate or aggregate economic activity. But I think one thing we really need to know now is, is who is being affected. Okay, So I told you this large number, 15%, but it's not equally distributed across occupations and, and type of people. So for instance, we find that the first people to lose their jobs were those with weaker employment ties. So if you had a temporary contract, you were very likely to be laid off. People working in occupations that required face-to-face -face interactions were very likely to be laid off. And in general, these are people who tend to have less education. So a university graduate has been less likely to lose their job. Now, the best predictor and the, the anchor saving people from losing their jobs, uh, we find, is the ability to do your job from home. So the share of tasks in your job that you can do from home. Um, to compare this to past recessions again, usually in recessions, it's been that men have been more likely to lose their jobs. So for instance, in um, the Great Recession, manufacturing was hit very hard. In this uh, recession, so far, it's been services that are hit very hard immediately. So people relying on face-to-face -face interactions. And therefore, we've seen that more women have actually lost their job. But what's even more curious is that above and beyond that, so even if we control for occupation, education, so individual and job characteristics, we still find that women have been more likely to lose their jobs, both in the US and the UK. I mean, do you have any views as to why that may be the case? So we can only speculate. We cannot, with our data, nail down the reason. One suspicious thing we find in our data is that women are spending relatively more time on childcare. And now we have this new item, homeschooling. And if in any way these things play a role in a decision to quit a job or for the employer who to keep, we could speculate that this might play a role. We, we know that governments have acted you know, quite swiftly and dramatically. And, you know, we know that these actions, while there's some common features, they also differ from country to country. Are you able yet to pick up um, the consequence of those different policies in terms of with the way that the shock is affecting the labor market? And, and, and how do you think, you, you know, your research or you would recommend others sort of monitor and, and give feedback to, in ways that might be useful for government as they kind of keep monitoring the situation? As I said, I think it's a first just to throw a lifeline to understand who is being affected. So we find that uh, one third of people are already having problems paying their bills, their usual bills, and many more expecting to have these problems in the future. Therefore, we think that our data can help to target uh, who we have to throw lifelines to. But uh, another thing, if you talk about the cross-country comparison, I personally think the short-term work schemes might be playing a large role. So here in the UK, the furloughing scheme was um, designed from scratch. Um, I was a bit surprised that uh, these type of schemes were not in place already, given the positive impact they seem to have had uh, seem to have had in the Great Recession in Germany in 2008, 2009, because they allow firms to adapt and to smoothen the shocks. Now here, these schemes were drawn up from scratch. The scheme, the chosen scheme is binary. So someone is either furloughed or not. Now imagine you're a firm, you have a, a crucial worker, say an accountant that has to sign off some expenses, but for that would only have to work 10 or 20% of their usual time. So now as a firm, you have to decide, should we run at reduced capacity and pay these workers 100% out of our own pocket? Or should we shut down and give the bill to the government that cover 80% of the salary that these people usually receive, up to 2,500 pounds? And I think this lack of granularity, so this binary decision, shutting down or not, is what is harming production at the moment. And it's going to be particularly crucial during the recovery. So during the recovery, there's a lot of uncertainty. People will have to test waters. We might have to scale back again, scale up again. And if you only have this margin of a binary decision, then it doesn't allow you to adapt to these shocks. So I think there's one thing we learned from our data is that it seems from the cross-country comparison that Germany's economy, workers have been so much less affected. It seems that the short-term work scheme could be very crucial to explain these differences. I'd be interested in learning a bit more about the German furlough scheme. Yeah, so 
the German scheme was put in place, uh, it started in some form in, in 1910 in the mining industry. So I guess one advantage is that it's a long running scheme. Um, and the great difference I would point to is the fact that it can be gradual. You can choose uh, to have a worker at 50%, at 20%, or at 70%. And in the other sense, it's quite similar that then the government, um, I think it previously was covering 60%. Now they're going to top up, uh, they're going to increase it to 80%. Uh, also, it, I think it gives more security that it can run up to 12 months, which uh, from my understanding, they've extended it to 21 months. From what I hear here, it's now going to be limited to July. Of course, that opens up a whole nother discussion of who has to foot the bill. If we give everybody for infinite furloughing schemes, uh, that's it's going to be very expensive. But I think the level of uncertainty we have for both, we're going to have to feed individuals. So if they're laid off, they're going to have to be living off of uh, welfare. And another great advantage of not having to lay them off is that you maintain this firm worker-specific human capital. Now, if we come into recovery and a firm has to rehire and retrain their workers, that's a lot of extra costs. And especially given the uncertainty we have now, they might be very reluctant to hire. So I think making it more gradual, you can drive down your production to 20%, 30%, ramp it up to 70%. And then if we have another peak, it goes down again rather than going from zero to 100 is, is, can be very beneficial at the moment. Are there regional differences in the economic impacts of the COVID shock within the UK? So in our data, we've found large regional differences, but they're largely driven from differences in the population and occupations that are there. So as expected, in some areas, job losses were higher than in others. But once you control for people's types of occupations, education, and, and these kind of characteristics, we do not find that uh, one region or the other uh, suffered much more or less. Should we be thinking about regional economic responses? I, I think it's dangerous to go down the route of trying to... Um, find the optimal policy for each uh, region because um, either we, we get a race to the bottom or we, we get favoritism for, for uh, swing voting regions, um, which is also not what we want. So I think it's better to think of solid um, uh, policies that are applicable everywhere. Meredith, I wonder, particularly as we think about imagining, you know, the, the the months and years ahead, in other words, you know, once the initial shock is perhaps at least, you know, we've become acclimatized to it or it's dealt with, um, perhaps you could comment on, you know, the medium and longer term picture and particularly perhaps from the perspective of trade. One comment on what Chris was saying when you, you had asked a question about data, and I think one important thing is all national governments collect data on labor markets and they record questions like, what is your occupation, et cetera. I think one of the things to highlight is Chris's research has introduced new questions that aren't in these standard government surveys, and they're a little bit more directed toward COVID. And so, for example, the questions about temporary contract workers. As you introduce new schemes, having these kind of new questions helps us kind of understand a little bit more precisely what's going on. And so um, I think that's one of the things that's, that's very beneficial. But moving into the discussion of trade, um, at the time of the Great Trade Collapse 2008-2009, that was the biggest decline in trade, I think, since World War II. And we basically had a decline of a little bit more than 17% globally from the peak of um, you know, 2007 to the trial, which was um, Q2 2009. The amazing thing was comparing that to previous recessions, it was highly synchronized. Um, and the question is, what's going to happen this time around? So the, the first thing that's kind of very salient at the forefront of people's minds is this question about medical supplies and have our supply chains stretched out too far. And I think we're seeing different policy responses in different parts of the world. So I think, um, you know, my personal opinion is the UK has actually had a, a good policy response, which is just, we haven't put on lots of export restrictions on medical equipment. We haven't essentially turned very nationalistic and closed things inward. And I think even when these questions have come up about, you know, what will be the fate of vaccines developed in the UK? I think, you know, I admire the fact that the view here has been, 
you know, we can't know how we're going to distribute this until we know when the vaccine comes and if the vaccine, you know, so the, the UK is leading part of this global vaccine initiative. And so that's all part of a, I think, a very internationalist type of approach to some of the problems of COVID. In contrast, we have the American view, we have, you know, some behavior in China. And I think, you know, in America, it's been right away, we're going to put on all these export restrictions, we're going to, you know, look out for number one and grab things ahead. And the U.S. is following up now, they're going to have a bunch of initiatives about trying to reshore supply lines and trying to bring as more and more production back from middle and low income countries around the world to the U.S. And I think it's going to be costly for America. It's not something that can be done quickly. And this is part of a longstanding policy the Trump administration has had. I think realistically, economists understand it might be necessary now for firms to think about, um, we have had a big shock and I now might think that another virus is going to come in the future and I need to have a resilient supply line. But, you know, that might cause a firm to have a second source for critical input. Might also lead governments to think about, are there some critical inputs that we need to stockpile? Or are there some critical types of manufacturing technologies that we need to ensure are still present in our economy? And so this is, you know, this question about ventilators. So I think some of the, the landscape of how we think about international production globally is changing a little bit. But at the end of the day, Firms engaged in free market enterprise are going to be looking for where they can produce things cheaply and with high levels of quality. And so it's going to be very difficult for firms to, you know, move out of a country like China, where there might be more risk of virus exposure, until they can identify a firm somewhere else that can produce at the same scale and at the same level of quality. It's going to be hard for them to you know, say, move some of their supply line to Eastern Europe. It might be the case that they choose, okay, we're going to have half of our supply of a particular input come from Eastern Europe, even though the cost of labor is higher. But we think that that short supply line is valuable because we know at the end of the day, we can move things in over by trucks. Um, I think another thing that's kind of coming up in this particular crisis, the global scope and the fact that it is... Um, Correlated with the decline in movement of people means that um, air cargo and air freight is going crazy. Um, about 90, well, so one half of UK exports that go to destinations other than the EU go by air. So that's a quarter of UK exports. It's a little bit less. I think it's 30% um, of UK imports from outside the EU. So that would be like a, a sixth of UK imports go by air, but a quarter of world air freight rates or routes are now gone. <laughs> and the prices of these air routes is really skyrocketed. And so um, if you had some high tech components that you needed to have access to quickly, it's going to be very difficult. Um, you know, if the price of, of anything you want to import has just gone up, you know, by 30%. So there might be an incentive for firms to think about do I want to shorten my supply lines? Do I want to think about multimodal supply lines? Like I want to have some stuff coming from Eastern Europe by truck, some stuff going to Asia by air. Um, but it's 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 changing the landscape. And at the end of the day, uh, low cost, high quality are like the two most important concerns. You've looked at how sort of trade has rebounded and how that has related to GDP growth in countries. I mean, what's your speculation about what may be facing you know the UK and other countries in the coming months and years? Trade flows follow GDP growth flows. So meaning that you know as soon as GDP growth rebounds, trade will start to rebound. That said, at the simplest level, when we do an analysis of, of aggregate income growth and how that correlates with aggregate trade growth, a decline or an increase in aggregate, aggregate income can only explain about half of the movement of trade. So this was sort of the case in, in 2008, 2009. And, and in the sense, and this is another way of saying economic models and predicting trade flows always perform poorly around recessions. Um, and so the most simple models we use perform poorly. Um, at the time of the great trade collapse, there was a number of um, different groups looking at how to enrich and better understand what were the causes. Some of the things that we looked at were trade financing, um, the role of trade policy during the great trade collapse, 
the role of inventory accumulation by firms, and um, also the role of sort of capital goods versus consumer goods. And I think um, there were efforts to keep trade financing available. And so sort of G20 countries had lots of efforts to make sure trade financing was available. Um, it was also the case that um, uh, inventory accumulation played a role. So firms that had accumulated a lot of inventory before the trade collapse were unlike, you know, they didn't really want to, Re, they wanted to run down those inventory and that kind of led to a little bit of a lag. But a big driver in the great trade collapse was capital goods. So cars, machinery, these are the big expensive things. If there's decline in demand for new investment capital in factories in the UK and factories in the US, that doesn't just reduce the trade flow of that machine, but it also spills over and all of the inputs of, that go into that machine are no longer needed. And so what we see is it's basically global supply lines for capital goods are what lead to big falls in trade. And so um, when people don't know where their income is coming from, whether it's a human being or a firm, they're very reluctant to make big expensive capital investments, be it cars or machines. And so until we get to a point where firms can see on oh, the future income will grow, they're going to be unlikely to get back into purchasing capital goods. And so that's going to be something really critical to get the economy started. Um, you know, simple policies, you know, we had various versions of cash for clunkers during the great trade collapse or and during the, the financial crisis. So the idea is like both in the UK and in the US, you're trying to get people to get rid of their old crummy, you know, polluting car and get a government subsidy to buy a new one. And the reason why the government wants to subsidize is because you want people to go out and buy a car so you can get more people off of unemployment and back into work in the auto factory. You know, similarly, you might think we could do something similar for um, cut taxes on firms that purchase new capital investment equipment. It can help improve productivity if they install the right equipment. And it can also put people to work making those those machines. Is there a role for an active industrial strategy in the months and in the years ahead? I personally am very skeptical of the use of activist industrial policy. And I think um, most Western economists are. Um, there's been an increased and renewed interest in using industrial policy because of the way China has used it and because of the tremendous growth that has happened there. And um, I think one of the things that if the UK or some Western economies go down the route of activist industrial policy, I think we are a bit more sensible and less command and control than they've been in, in East Asia. So I think people look to China and they see a lot of production, but they don't see the cost that it has had, which is basically, you know, a lot of this is taxpayers putting the bill. They don't have a democracy. Taxpayers don't get to voice opposition to these policies in the way um, we can in the West. We know that if you're going to use an activist industrial policy, one approach is to kind of stimulate demand, right? And so the, the core question is, why do you want this industrial policy? What's the objective? So if the objective is that you want to get an industry to a size that it will then have some product available to consumers widely, and the government's overwhelming concern is that they think people should have that product. So an example would be solar panels or some green energy thing. If the government really wants people to use green energy, but the technology is such that it's too expensive, the government can stimulate more action in that area by either subsidizing consumption of, of green energy products, you know, subsidize electric cars, or um, they can directly procure it, right? So we know that part of the, the cost of commercial aircraft is in a sense cross-subsidized by the fact that um, governments buy military fighter aircraft. So if you buy military fighter aircraft and you procure that, all of the technology developed can then eventually bubble down to the commercial aircraft area. You know, and I think one of the issues, there's a couple of things where the UK is particularly well suited towards certain technologies and there's interest in developing those technologies. So one of the ones has been batteries, you know, the question, are we going to have electric cars? Um, and I think if you talk to scientists working at universities like Cambridge, a lot of people in the engineering area will say, well, actually, we don't do enough in getting technology to the marketplace in the way that happens in the United States. And so they would say the different types of programs the U.S. government has are, are somewhat more effective to create the right incentives for 
American scientists and engineers working at universities to take these technologies to you know venture capitalists or whatever, and then on to to commercialization. Um, but I'll I'll throw out just a couple of you know caveats. So I think there's been this renewed interest ever since you know we started talking about Brexit and this question of after leaving the EU when we're no longer under the European um, subsidy regime and the state aid formulas, is there a desire for for doing some type of active industrial policy here? I would say that um, we know as economists, it is better to try to stimulate the demand side and then let the firms fight it out in terms of who's the most competitive and how do we get the most competitive firms going. The question is always, though, if we're stimulating demand, are we stimulating demand for the right products? So, for example, you know, there's all these like examples of antiquated technologies and government backing the wrong technology. You know, so should government have supported people buying blackberries or should they have supported people buying, you know, cell phones and what's the right way to, to develop certain markets? One small concrete example. Um, there was, a, I think, overwhelming concern in Europe around 2000 about green energy. And the German response was, we want to increase efficiency of solar panels and the German government said, well, we don't want to directly subsidize solar panel manufacturers. So what we're going to do is we're going to indirectly have a way of subsidizing consumption by German consumers. Actually, the Chinese were very heavily state subsidized, and they came in and basically just undercut all the German manufacturers in terms of price. Essentially, the subsidies that the German government was providing to consumers to buy solar panels was really ending up in the pocket of Chinese manufacturers of solar panels. If your objective was to develop German production of the technology, that went sideways. It's tricky to get industrial policy right, and you have to be quite precise in what do you really want to achieve. You know, if, if the UK government does have as an objective to increase productivity of the UK economy as a whole, <laughs> given what you've just said, what would your advice be? Because it's so it's so difficult to look into the crystal ball, I think general concerns about how do we generally set the right environment to stimulate productivity is the best one. So looking at general, you know, are there real shortages of human capital in particular sectors? Um, and what are, the, what are really the hindrances to developing productivity? Do we not have the right incentives in place to induce firms to replace their capital stock at a rapid clip? Um, what's your... What would your advice be to governments in terms of, of, you know, the next couple of years in terms of, of how to respond to the immediate crisis and think about, you know, building, building resilience or building productivity over the slightly longer term? So I think it starts with data and the model always can only predict as well as the data it's being fed. And often this is very aggregate data. I guess right now what everybody's worried about is bottlenecks and that's particularly for opening up the economy. Those are the sectors or the, the firms we're going to have to prioritize. And their more risk might also be warranted. But we have a very bad idea of what the bottlenecks are. We're looking into a crystal ball if we're just using the data that we have. I mean, Meredith, you've, you've been very actively engaged over the last couple of years thinking about you know, UK policy with respect to trade and, and Brexit. I mean, what's your sense of the... the the, the, that relationship between academic economics, economic analysis within government and, and public policy? I think Britain has a long tradition of evidence-based policy, right? So if you go to different ministries, they're building their own models. You know, the Department of International Trade has its own trade model in-house. You know, what I would hope that would continue is that the UK just continues with this strong evidence-based policymaking approach and that they continue to have their own models in house and seek that external opinion because I think you know one role for academic economists is you know it, regardless of the system we can always say look you've made this model and and this is a bad policy like we can tell you this one's gonna this one's gonna cost a fortune so we can often say this you know you might have some desire because you want to help the public in certain ways you might want something because it's politically popular but we can tell you it's not going to work out that well and so i think that you know one role for economists is just to say this policy whether it's too free market or too um you know socialist it's just not going to work like so i think that's a useful role we have to play thank you to christopher and meredith for giving us this clear and compelling account of what economics has to say about the uncertainties and challenges we face
this will be a set of dilemmas facing countries around the world for months to come. So we're really grateful to you. Thank you again. CSAP Science and Policy Podcast is a production of the Center for Science and Policy at the University of Cambridge. This series, Science, Policy, and Pandemics, has been produced in partnership with Cambridge Infectious Diseases and the Cambridge Immunology Network. This episode was hosted by Dr. Rob Doubleday and produced by me, Kate McNeil. Our guests this week were Dr. Meredith Crowley and Dr. Christopher Ra. You can learn more about CSAP's work by visiting us on Twitter at CSIPOL or by visiting our website at www.csap.cam.ec.uk. If you have feedback about this episode or questions you'd like us to address in a future week, please email inquiries at csap.cam.ec.uk. Thanks for listening.